Good evening, and welcome to Having a Drink with Mink. Already in progress, I'm your host, Jason Mink. Thanks for dropping by, and a big hello to all of our new viewers. Let's get down to it, but before we begin, I hope that you have a nice beverage on hand. I know that I do. Ah, you can't have everything. I mean, the dusting alone would be murder. Here are five more things that I didn't buy, but I wish that I had. And right off the bat, walking away from this one kind of hurt. I grew up Star Wars and spent a lot of time in Kenner's droid factory. I mean, it was the place to be. Both a playset and a toy laboratory, the item offered remarkable value for the price. 33 interchangeable parts allowed you to assemble a variety of robotic companions scaled to your three and three quarter inch figures, including an R2-D2 complete with third leg. Sounds dubious, but trust me, it's canon. If this set were complete, it would be worth a couple hundred bucks, but this one was missing a lot of bits and still outside of my price range. However, it was cool to see it again and remember all of the adventures had long ago in a galaxy that's now far, far away. Marketing an action figure tie-in alongside of your blockbuster movie is nothing new. The James Bond franchise did it way back in 1964. At 12 inches tall, this miniaturized super spy stood head to toe with G.I. Joe, although he moved more like a Ken doll. As if that weren't bad enough, the figure came in a t-shirt and a pair of bathing trunks. And while yes, it replicated one of the scenes from the movie Thunderball, getting Bond in anything but his trademark tuxedo is a baffling choice. Although the head is oversized, the likeness to actor Sean Connery is surprisingly good for 1965. This guy came with some scene-specific gear, including flippers, a diving mask, and this nutty metal pistol that actually fires Capcom ammunition. You need this odd metal harness to attach it to his little doll hand, and I'm betting it all broke pretty quickly, but still, an innovative design for a rarely remembered toy. They even made an odd job figure. Your sister's Barbie will never know what hit her. Remember ventriloquism? That was an odd trend, and more popular than you might realize. Throwing one's voice began as a religious practice among the ancient Greeks and Romans before we Westerners evolved it to its current state of sophistication. This dapper little fellow is Charlie McCarthy, famed partner of American entertainer Edgar Bergen. How famed? Well, people listened to Bergen perform ventriloquy over the radio and it was a smash hit. This made the officially licensed Charlie McCarthy dummy a must-have for kids and adults alike. Unlike poor James Bond, this guy gets a full tux, complete with top hat and bow tie. But wait, there's more. A lot more. This particular model came from the original owner, who was all in on the concept. Check out this note on the side of the box. It's a wonderful sentiment and reminder of a quieter, gentler time, when talking to yourself wasn't just something that people with bird's nests in their beards did on the bus. Here are the original instruction manuals, important for those of you who think that the vent routine is getting your puppet stuck in a heating duct. There's even a packet of unused ventrilo aid, which sounds like a delicious and refreshing drink, but is in reality a rubber band you stick in your mouth to learn jaw control. Lastly, here are some newsletters for those living it 24-7. Like this guy. He especially enjoys entertaining foreigners. Yeah, I'll bet. The official opened the case, and there, inside, lay the body of a small boy. The official was taken aback. He was still filled with awe after he realized the boy was a wooden dummy. Wild stuff. And it's not just weird dudes who were into ventriloquy. Weird chicks dig it, too. I think this gal's missing a trick by not simply throwing her voice out of that hairdo of hers. That thing is downright Henson-esque. Let's wrap things up with a call to social services, as this pair clearly needs separating. I never thought a block of carved wood could look terrified, but here we are. 
Close Encounters of the Third Kind was a phenomena at the box office, but there were no licensed toys to capitalize on the success. Well, all right, there was one, but folks understandably don't like to talk about it. Yes, this is the extraterrestrial, but does it have to be so nude? Surely it gets cold in space. A robe, a spacesuit, even James Bond's bathing trunks would be preferable to old Smiley here in the raw. Couple that with the baby oil sheen and an expression that makes you double check the locks on your doors and we have a figure that even the dog would be reticent to chew up. And he eats out of the litter box. We wrap up this segment with a truly top shelf piece of nostalgic goodness. Nomira's Gorilla is one of those classic battery operated tin toys that had their heyday in the 1950s. This being the albino version, it's often misidentified as a Yeti. Our example is a bit blonder, either the natural results of age or possibly contact with cigarette smoke, another 1950s favorite. The engineering on this toy is rock solid. Here's the control box featuring some wonderful lithographed ape art and powered by two big honkin' D batteries. When activated, our simian pal has a few impressive moves, notably walking, swinging his arms, and well, why tell you when you can just experience it for yourself? Alright, now to talk old comics, specifically a small Silver Age Marvel collection that came into the store the other day. Presumably a trove of pure delight, but in reality something... different. Problems. These books have them. First off, the back cover and last page are missing. On all of them. Now I understand why the top third or even the entire cover might be missing, as these were once cut from unsold comics and returned to the publisher for credit, but the back? Of all of them? There were easily 300 comic books in this collection, all with this identical issue. Weird, huh? Well, we're just getting started. Because the covers and back page were removed, the entire structure of the comic has been compromised. To compensate, the previous owner stapled every book, top and bottom, through the cover. Not only does this put big holes in the paper, it means that I can't scan them without either bending them up or removing the staples. Finally, you know that old comic smell that we all love so much? Well, these have it in abundance. They're riferous, as my friend Joe Lombardo might say. Potent. <laughs> Exotic, even. They stink, in no uncertain terms. For all that, they were cheap, and my chance to share genuine Silver Age Marvel comics with you. So let's plug our noses and dive right in. When I was a kid, my grandmother would take me into downtown Pittsburgh, and if I behaved, I could pick a comic off the spinner rack at G.C. Murphy's. Instead of the latest issues, I would go after the reprints. Thanks to the ubiquity of Marvel Tales, I understood that many of the best stories had already been told, and reprints were my chance to play catch-up. I clearly remember buying this issue as reprinted in Marvel Super Action 23. I had no idea who any of these guys were back then. All I knew was that the Avengers were a colorful team of superheroes made up of robots, mutants, and jungle princes, so I accepted the premise and tuned into the story. Turns out sometimes Avenger and Archer Hawkeye's ex-girlfriend Black Widow is missing in action after going on a dangerous mission for Nick Fury. With the rest of the team otherwise occupied, it's up to Hawk to save the day, but he isn't going to do it slinging arrows. Instead, he breaks into resident mad scientist Hank Pym's locker and steals his clothes and his patented growth formula. That's got to be against the bylaws. I'd seen Goliath before, but the fantastic nature of the character hadn't struck me until experiencing it here. 
Gene Kalan's art sells the concept, conveying the larger-than-life nature of the hero within the context of his world. We feel the same sense of wonder here that Clint does, marveling at this newfound power and perspective while simultaneously embarking on a fairy tale adventure to save the princess. This is a seminal Avengers tale, not because it introduced some hot new character or idea to spin a movie series off of, but instead for being an instantly accessible story of love, honor, and heroism that we can all identify with and aspire to. Top Shelf Stuff Following on with issue 65 and The Swordsman Strikes For those of you in the dark, Swordsman is the carny who taught Hawkeye his archery skills and showmanship. He was always trouble, like here, when he shows up unannounced at Avengers Mansion and causes a ruckus. And for all you aspiring artists, composition matters. When you can, try and avoid placing one character's head squarely against another's crotch. Unless you're drawing a Tijuana Bible or something. Next up, it's Captain America and a crack up on campus. No, Lenny Bruce isn't doing stand up in the student union. It's more Marvel melodrama as Cap and new super pal the Falcon part ways. And what a team up, huh? All they need is Jimi Hendrix and they've got it made. Now there's a comic that I would have bought. With the Red Skull finally defeated, Cap is looking to get his love life going again. Only Nick Fury has sent Sharon Carter off on a dangerous mission. Sounds familiar. This guy was always doing sketchy crap, like putting old Winghead to sleep and planting a suggestion in his head to go mix it up on a college campus somewhere. Modoc shows up, more a tease than anything, as the issue ends without any sort of big battle or resolution. Still, the Gene Colon artwork is solid, clearly the reason he features in so many of these titles. Daredevil 20 poses a question that I always thought I knew the answer to. What color is the owl's hair? Because on the cover here, he's as blonde as Barbie, but on the inside he's gone to Leslie Nielsen white. Things finally settle down by the middle of the issue, but seriously, what gives? Only his hairdresser knows for sure. Daredevil 25 is this week's big key issue, with the introduction of the Larcenous Leapfrog. As far as villains go, one can argue Froggy is one of the sillier ones. Oh sure, we can accept rhinos, tarantulas, and scorpions, but a guy shows up dressed as Kermit, and it's more or less over from the jump, so to speak. But for all his corniness, I'll take LP here over the endless horde of faceless ninjas Daredevil's been dogged by since the 1980s. At the end of the day, watching a blind lawyer fighting a ne'er-do-well in a homemade frog costume is just more entertaining, which is really the whole point of these things. Next up, and some post-Ditko Doctor Strange. This was an odd era for the book, as writer Roy Thomas attempted to advance the story while remaining true to the esoteric nature of the title. And that's our old pal, Mean Gene Colon, on art again. He seems to have more to work with here, providing some nicely composed shots with a lot of detail to please the eye. Issue 175 sees the introduction of another character to the magical mythos, one of nefarious intent. So, what should this new demonic villain be called? I don't know, something Satanish? That's it! Brilliant! Oh sure, Marvel added the extra N, but we noticed. We notice everything. Another enigmatic elemental foe, this titan would go on to terrorize the Sorcerer Supreme and his girl Clea, who is expertly rendered here. This panel is so 60s I feel like Steve McQueen is going to pull up in a 1968 Ford Mustang Bullet GT and offer me a Moscow Mule. And this is the big one, folks. At least, that was the plan, with Marvel giving Doctor Strange a superhero makeover. I get it. Those were the books that were doing well, and the Doc still had a lot of sales potential, so making him look a little less like Clark Gable wasn't the craziest idea. The rationale for it is more or less incidental. Something about Asmodeus stealing his face? I thought only Jerry Garcia could do that. It's a cool look, but at the time, it wasn't really embraced by fans, and soon enough the Donk was back to his old mustachioed self. Some things are just fine the way they are. 
Next up, Domestic Bliss is the word of the day in Fantastic Four 88. Baby Franklin has finally arrived and parents Reed and Sue wonder if the Baxter building is an appropriate environment to raise up a child. I guess the answer is no, as the FF go house hunting. Seems like a fairly uninspired premise, but this isn't just any house, as our heroes soon discover. For a start, it's trying to kill them. In every dream home a heartache, I suppose. Issue 89 sees us encounter the madness of the Mole Man. Nearing the end of Kirby's epic run illustrating Marvel's flagship title, this issue speeds by due to Jack using less panels, collage, and an over-dependence on full-page illustration. It isn't that they're not nice to look at, but readers spoiled by the title's former grandeur can be forgiven for feeling a little let down by such shortcuts. This image of the Human Torch would go on to be used for licensing purposes. Iron Man had some weird villains. And no, I'm not talking about Happy Hogan as the freak. Although maybe I should. Here I am fights an honest-to-goodness minotaur. Oh, not at first. Our story begins with Tony's pity party. He's just not in the mood to have fun tonight, girls. Well, maybe having the piss beaten out of him by a mythological creature will change his mood. Seriously, Miklos here stomps a mud hole into Stark's tin keister. Maybe Tony should have stayed at the party after all. Some moody artwork from Johnny Craig gives the story a bittersweet twist. It's that pulse-pounding Marvel pathos. Or did I forget to take my heart medicine again? Submariner finally graduated from Tales to Astonish into his own title. Issue 10 sees him confronting a new seaborne adversary, Carthon the Quester. Oh sure, he's not mentioned in the title or anything, but trust me, he's here. And he's got the serpent crown. That never ends well. Nice colors, though. I was also lucky enough to snap up a few issues of Thor, and I noticed something. In comics, there's ugly, and then there's Kirby ugly. I'm not sure if this was a stylistic choice, or actually just the way Jack sees people, but he really has a knack for it. And it isn't as though all his characters look like Jack Elam's kids. I mean, this here fish man is handsome as Rawhide Kid. Not sure about the purple underpants and opera gloves, though. And here's a familiar looking fella. Jack, this is just a creature of the Black Lagoon. Have it colored orange, Stanley. I have eight more pages to finish. Frank Zappa was a self-confessed comics fan. In fact, he was the first rock musician to advertise in their pages. Here's the ad for We're Only In It For The Money, Frank's blistering commentary on the then-trendy hippie culture. And since we were just talking about Jack, here's a nifty pick. Seems Jack visited that Zappa household a number of times once the Kirbys moved to California. Imagine being a fly on that wall. More Thor with issue 156, The Hammer and the Holocaust sees all heck break loose, with the Odin son being crushed by a mammoth hand. It's Magog sent by Loki to humble his noble stepbrother. Elsewhere, on the Rainbow Bridge, a stranger doth approach, and he's not selling grit. The Realm Eternal gets attacked a lot. Maybe they should unlist their number or dig a moat or something. If we're talking Silver Age Marvel, then we're going to have to have some Spidey in the form of Marvel Tales 28 and the return of the Molten Man. Turns out he's out of prison and Spidey's decided to keep an eye on him. This is a nice little sequence from Steve Ditko. Nothing flashy, just Spidey sneaking around in the dark before placing a spider tracer in Multi's lapel. This allows him to track the villain down and... Lest you think that Manny's changed his criminal ways, dig this tearaway suit designed for just such an occasion. The two start to womp on one another in typical fashion, with writer Stan Lee peppering the dialogue with in-jokes for Marvelites in the know. While Ditko would be leaving the book three issues hence, there isn't any drop-off in quality. With the artist now plotting the stories, it seemed like the title was headed in an interesting direction. As we all know, it was not meant to be. How Green Was My Goblin sees Jazzy John Ramita picking up the pencil. 
Now free to do what he liked with the book, Lee immediately set about crafting an epic confrontation between the Green Goblin and Spidey. While Romita does a decent job at times of mirroring Ditko's style, his own take on the character was still in its infancy, leading to a few unintentionally hilarious panels. Still, Lee's storytelling and the momentum of events keep things flowing nicely, leading to the iconic moment where a triumphant goblin carries a maskless Spidey off into the night. Things end on a cliffhanger resolved in this very issue because Marvel Tales was still a 68-pager. The Green Goblin's identity is revealed. This was a point of contention between Lee and Ditko, as Stan wanted Norman Osborn in the role, while Steve wanted it to be a total stranger to both Spidey and the reader. With hindsight, it's clear Lee was laying the groundwork for a lasting conflict, but at the time, Osborn probably felt more like a gotcha move, based less on story and more on sensationalism. However, it did provide us with this image of Ogabi, which was later used as Migo card art. Notice how they carefully omitted the glider. Guess he's got to walk everywhere now. Marvel Silver Age. Kind of hard to argue with, really. The over-the-top dialogue, quirky characterization, and sheer audaciousness of the storytelling makes these tales that will endure. Lee and company captured lightning in a bottle manifesting a near-instant modern mythology for the pop culture generation. The astonishing art, vibrant color, and overall aesthetics resonate all these years later. If the abundance of reprints is any indication, I know that I can't get enough of them. That's all for today, boys and girls. If you enjoyed this episode, please give it a thumbs up. We'd love to hear from you, so drop us a line in the comment section below. Until the next time, face front, true believers.